fucking every hole. Keep fucking every hole. Keep fucking every hole. Hello, and welcome to Disc Golf Live Video Magazine. Thanks for tuning in. California is the setting for much of our show this time around, as we feature a pair of productions from the Golden State. Along the way, we'll hear from a disc golfer in Minnesota about a home-built project that just about any disc golfer can tackle. We'll get things started right after this. Production and distribution of Disc Golf Live is made possible through the generous support of our underwriters. Thanks for your support. Santa Cruz, California is the setting for our first story this show, highlighting action from the recent Masters Cup. This piece comes from our friends over at Central Coast Disc Golf. What up, gang? CCDG and Dynamic Discs are bringing you some more disc golf action. All right, guys, Ian here from Central Coast Disc Golf, and we have our special guest commentator, Garrett Tapkin, is What's joining that? us. That's Garrett. Yeah, good to be back. And again. we have, yeah, <laughs> glad to have you, man. Yeah. And we're on the uh, 2014 Masters Cup uh, MPL League card final round. Would you look at that card, Garrett? Some action going on. Super sweet. We got a uh, Innova sponsored Paul Macbeth, Innova sponsored Tim Skellinger, Dismania sponsored Simon Lazar, and a uh, Prodigy sponsored Ricky Wasaki. And uh, Paul's got a three stroke lead going into the final round, and somebody you don't want to give three stroke leads to, that guy is That's him. top of my list yeah, right there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> He's pretty solid. But uh, Anything can happen on this course, though. Oh, absolutely. Daylight. You get kicks, roots, trees, cliffs, everything comes into play at Daylight, yeah. I was talking to Tim, he's like, last year I came out here, man, I picked up so much trash, I'm getting some good juju. <laughs> <laughs> it totally paid off for him, he's a yeah. lead card, right? <laughs> Give back to the course, it'll take care of you. Exactly, man, totally cool. But uh, we're going to start off a hole one, 306 feet. I think it's one of the more difficult holes in the course. It's really uphill, a low ceiling once you get close to the basket, tons of roots, tons of trees, double mando. It's, the list goes on. It's a hell of a way to start off. <laughs> and uh, Paul Macbeth is on the box and rips out his Star Destroyer. Squeaking through there. Oh, oh, yep. There's one of them daylight trees yep. right there, Garrett. <laughs> Up next is Tim Skellinger, uh, pro out of Oregon. Really cool dude. Big fan. After filming him for a couple days. Good. Ooh, got through. Looking really nice. He's up there for birdie putt. Probably about a 20, 25 footer. Up next out of Germany, uh, Simon Lizotte. Also a super nice guy. And this kid throws a while, Garrett. Yeah, surprised he's not throwing a mid-range or something. <laughs> and, but he parked it at least yeah. with the driver. It's probably the right, right choice. Unbelievable shot. That right kind of hyzer line is the preferred route. It's a little more open over there. Not yeah. that you can really call it open. Yeah, it seems seems like everybody's going for that. Yeah. And uh, Ricky is Ricky's pretty good, too. It's part two. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've seen three better drives on a four-person card. No. So you can see where Beth kicked off to, almost at a two fairway. He just lays it for a nice, easy par. And uh, Tim has this for a birdie look. Shouldn't be a problem. A little yeah. bit uphill. Yeah, just outside the circle, it looks like. Nails it. Bang, bang. Really nice putt. So uh, it looks like Simon's got a straddle around this tree for his birdie look. Squeaks it in there. Nonchalant as ever, right? <laughs> <laughs> and Ricky's got a tap in. One of the nicest drives I've ever seen on one. Yeah. Unbelievable. I see some people throw rollers on one. 
Forehand or backhand? Backhand. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes yeah. it works when you, you get some uh, lucky root bounces. Yeah, some lucky <laughs> lucky yeah. jumps and Definitely turns. takes a little bit of luck on some rollers at Dayla. <laughs> but uh, everybody get a stroke on Paul on first hole. Bring it on, making our lead card a little closer. Pretty exciting. Yeah, it doesn't happen very often that everybody picks one up on him. Right? Seriously. Uh, up next is hole two. 288, dog leg left, kind of straightens out, and just ridiculously uphill. And uh, also mentioned the basket is on the edge of a cliff. It kind of drops down about 15 feet. There's a little shelf, and then it's just bye bye Even with a good drive, still have a death putt. Yep, exactly. So uh, Tim has the box, throws that backhand hyzer line, and he gets up there decently. He's, I think he got knocked down by a tree a little short. Up next is Simon. Spiking it up there. Yeah, same line as a Tim, a little higher. Oh, Ooh. just caught that tree loop. Comes up for that. That's a difficult up. It's all hard pan, a little bit downhill. Fast green. Yep, and a cliff behind the pin. So Ricky offs with an Annie backhand or a forehand line, which I like a lot. Yeah, it seems like if it flexes out, yeah, it'd be your best bet at getting yeah, up there. Somebody aced it what, last year with that shot. <sighs> right? Crazy. Paul Macbeth going on the uh, backhand hyzer line. And that one's looking really good, Ooh, Garrett. Squeak through. Going around all yeah. the trees. Wow. And he's got a pretty putt if he yep. wants it. Scary one, <laughs> but it's but there. It's there. Yep. Exactly. So Simon with a really good uh, layup on a, a dangerous upshot, and uh, Ricky's just a little bit closer. Seems like you're happy with nailing your upshots here. Yeah, absolutely, and not easy at all. Yep. All three of those guys laying in for nice pars, and uh, Paul has a birdie putt. Trying to take that stroke back he gave up? Yeah, exactly. I'm sure that's exactly what he's thinking. Oh. Oh, no. Oh, no. Mm. Roller. That one's gone. So Paul went so far down the cliff that I didn't want to follow him. <laughs> but eventually you'll see oh, his comes. disc come up. There he is. He was about like 60 feet down that cliff. It looks steep. Yeah, it was really steep. And I makes the four at least. Four. Yep. yep. I, was, I was talking to him after the round. He's like, I should have just re-putted from uh, that previous spot. <laughs> <laughs> Taking the stroke in, yeah. in the shorter. But he said shorter he, he hasn't been really confident in his knee putts this year, he hmm. said. Which I don't know why. Knee putts are tough. Yeah. He usually bangs them, though. Yeah. So uh, Rick makes his par, Simon makes his, and uh, Tim's going to walk over and tap, drop in his par. <clears throat> really tough hole. If you're aggressive, it, it can eat you up. I bet. Like a lot of holes at Dayla, actually. Yeah. Risk-reward all over the place. <laughs> it is really true. It's not It's not your uh, your Sunday afternoon park. <laughs> yeah, it's not. <laughs> it's a hike with some cliffs. Uh, up next is hole three, 349, pretty, pretty downhill. Um, this one's see a lot of options. There's the forehand hyzer, uh, backhand sky roller, and then backhand mid range right up the middle. Yeah. yeah, all work. I've seen uh, birdies with all three approaches. And there's kind of a, a lot of trees guarding the pin, so it's a little bit of lucky once you get down there. Yeah, kind of a poke and pray. Mm -hmm. So it looks like Tim's hyzer flipping his rock. And it, Skip? It, yeah, it uh, skips down there, but didn't flip quite enough for him. I think he went a little more turn over there. And Simon's got a forehand. Simon has a forehand. And smashes it. Wow. Way up there. Wow. I, I think he learned that line from Avery. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Avery or even yep. Ricky right here. Yep. Yeah, Smash. Ricky throws it too. Gets it out there. It's fading towards the basket. Oh. Got caught up on something. He's in a tree. Oh, uh, no. Yeah. It's Usually they come down on this hole, but Ricky got unlucky and just kind of wedged in there. Paul's throwing his rock three in. A little high, a little right. Um, got kind of down there. It's good. Yeah, that's a long, pretty putt he's got right here. Yeah. Through a lot of trees. Probably more of a half layup, half run yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. That should be within Paul's par range. So Ricky has this to save par after the uh, two meter stroke. He's about 45, 50 out. And it looks like he's just laying up for a nice safe four. I think no. he might have caught a branch in there too. Oh, uh, did he? Gotcha. So Tim has this for a birdie. It's probably about 50 out. It's a good look at it. 40 out. Oh, just hits the cage. And here is Simon coming back towards the pin for his birdie. No problem. Floats it right in. Yep. Every time. Yep. Every time. A lot of the time. A lot of the time. <laughs> More than I would at the time. Yep. More than most mortal humans would. Indeed. Paul makes his par, Tim drops in his. Gingerly. Yes. <laughs> you don't want to bounce it right out, you know? <laughs> yeah. You put it in there too hard. <laughs> Bad things could happen. <laughs> so Rick with the unfortunate bow, and uh, Paul's lead is 
down to one over Tim and Simon. Pretty intense. Mm -hmm. Some dangerous people to be only one ahead of. <laughs> it seriously is. And we are on the hole four, 390 feet. And this is one that has a cliff off to the right-hand side of the fairway the entire way. Um, once you go over that hill, there's just trees everywhere. I see a lot of back, or sorry, forehand rollers. Yeah. That's right. And then backhands over the top. And Simon, who hung it out a little wide and caught that tree, but he did kick left instead of right. Not down the mountain. Yeah, right, and you're losing <laughs> a disc 100%. But he's still got a ways to go on his next shot. Tim's throwing the yeah. backhand too. He stayed left on that one. Yep, and he almost kills Tim, <laughs> <laughs> who's filming for us right there. <laughs> Paul, go with the forehand roller. Yep, I'm seeing pretty. I think he throws this pretty much every round. He's like, "This is the shot," and I agree. It's good hole design when, you know, the top people have to pull something like this that they don't pull out of their bag every time. And, I like that. Yeah, you know. Uh huh. That's a really good, uh, really good uh, idea. Mm -hmm. Rick likes the forehand roller as well. He parked it in the uh, the Friday round, which is just bananas. Yeah, it shows how good they actually are when they have to pull something yeah. uncomfortable for them, and they're still able to do it very well. Very well. And he, I think he would have got there again if he didn't hit that tree yep. root and got yep. a out a little bit. So they can see where the pin is, and Simon's taking this high line, which I, I'm scared of on this hole just because those trees are so grabby by the pin. It's just it's a tough window. But going low has its own uh, <laughs> dangers as well. Roots, skips, rolls. Exactly. Anything. So Tim went a little long left. It's going to have a tough comebacker. And this is Simon's third shot. Look at just laying up for a bogey. And even then, just laying up, up. see how long it slides. This hard pan, your disc just does not want to stop. Paul laying up after a pretty good forehand roller. And here's Rick with a, somewhat of a pretty look. Yeah. Kind of scary if you 100% run it, though. With an awkward stance. Yeah. Oh. Oh. It's looking good. It wasn't it? Yeah. So that's where Tim went on his uh, third shot, a little long, just laying up for a four. And uh, Rick has this for a par. Jamie Thomas. Uh, oh, yep. Yep. Heiser Cinema Spin TV. Super nice guy. Quality videos, for sure. Yeah, really nice. Does great work. He makes my editing skills look really bad. <laughs> <laughs> I do what I can, people. Yeah. I do what I can. <laughs> I get the video out. California's Lake Tahoe may be drying up like the rest of the state, but disc golf in the area hasn't receded a bit with eight courses now in play. A Tahoe-based crew called Pure Heiser Productions put together our next story. Hi, I'm Pavo Stubstad with Pure Heiser Productions. With me today I've got John Podani, or as he's known in the disc golf community more commonly, just Pod. What's up? Pod is the uh, course marshal here at Truckee River Regional Park, where we're going to see round two coverage of a women's only tournament that took place here on September 6th, I believe it was, Mama Bears. So this is the sixth event out of seven of the 2014 Poppy Series. The Poppy Series, created last year, was, is the first ever women's only disc golf series. And now this is in year two, and there are some other series following up. So it's really nice to see the ladies come out here and not have to deal with a bunch of knucklehead dudes getting in the way. All right, so let's get to the second round coverage of Mama Bears. First up in first place, we've got Jessica Weiss from Grass Valley, California with a rating of 934. She shot a two down. Next up, Leah Feltenstein, Truckee, California. Her rating's 890 and she shot an even. Christine King in third place with one over. She's got a rating of 921 from Paradise, California. And Dawn Lenhart from Roseville, California. Rating of 862, she was one over the first round. Tied for third. Here we 
Here we go, the first hole is in the A pin. It's a par three, 254 feet, straight ahead. <laughs> so be to the right, but there's a big netting over the fence, so it takes a real bad shot to get over that fence. Jessica throws a flick out there, a little low, but she gets a good skip toward the basket. That shouldn't Gets be away bad. with it, but leaves her some work. Off the fence and over and safe. Threw right over that OB and got back in without hitting. She's anything. about pin high there, probably looking at 30, 40 feet. Just a little right. Christine's throwing the flick too. That's her inside the circle. Here's Dawn. Settle. Ties her out a little early, but she, she might still. She got around the OB. Jessica just lays up for a smart par. Here's Don's birdie look. Just a little short. Give it a chance. Christine for birdie. Oh, does not take advantage of that great kick she had. Yep. Here's Leah's second throw. Ooh. Oh, Leah almost got it there. Just a tiny bit low. You gotta get up to get yeah, in. Leah's putt was a little uphill, so those ones are easy to hit the basket. Absolutely. It looks so good when you throw it. Don and Leah tap in their pars, and looks like we have a star par on the first hole. A parte. And we move on to hole two. This one's also in the A pin, 255 feet, straight ahead. This one for the backhanders, it's a nice big hyzer window, or you could go through those trees on the left. Jessica goes for the big hyzer. That looked real good. She should just be a little bit right, maybe 25, 30 feet. We do play a asphalt paths OB on this course, and if you go about 80 feet deep, you could be on the path. We treat it as a river, so if you go beyond, you're okay. Yeah, that's right. Behind the basket, it drops off, and there is a paved path down there. Skip. Yep, yep. Christine got a good nice. skip over there. Sean goes for the flick route on the left. It's coming back nicely. Nice. That's the route people like when it's on the B position, not so much on the A. Leah for birdie. It's just a little low, it looked like. Uh, Jessica just off the cage. Yeah. Dawn just a little high. One more birdie putt here. Let's see if Christine can put this in. And we get a birdie. Yeah, the other three players are just going to tap in their pars, and we move on to hole three. So Christine, with the only birdie there, moves up into a tie for second place with Leah. Jessica still two strokes ahead. Anyone's ball game at this point. So you can see the bike path on the sign. It, basically, the fairway goes right along that bike path the whole way unless you take the wider uh, hyzer route to the right. He goes up the hyzer route, and it looks pretty good. <laughs> Skips over there. <laughs> it's definitely the route I take there on all three pin placements on this hole. That's the safe route to avoid the path. 
I think the window's bigger, too. It's hard to get through that window up the gut. Yeah, it is. If it's high at all, it catches these branches that you can't see until you hit them. Jessica took the flicker out there and just ties her out a little early. She should be just down to the right of the pin. Leah takes the safer hyzer route. Leah throws nothing but backhands off the tee, so the other girls, and I think Dawn throws pretty much all flicks. That's right. Oh. I think Jessica and Christine mix up flicks and backhands. Yeah. Hear the breeze coming up here. It's typical trucky in the afternoon. The wind will pick up. This hole's generally into a headwind. It's Jessica down to the right of the pin. And I zoomed the wrong way and lost her shot, but she just put it up there for an easy bar. Dawn to save her par. There you can hear the train going by on the other side of the river, very near the course. Ooh, Christine almost had another birdie there, just a little short on the putt. You can kind of see the path there down to the right. It actually loops all the way back around. So in this hole, there's OB on all sides. But it easily takes some... Poor luck to actually land and stay on the path. Yeah, especially on this placement. For the longer ones, some people might want to try to go down the path and, and get a little closer to them, in which case there's more risk. So three pars and a bogey on that hole. The Professional Disc Golf Association is the governing body for the sport of disc golf. From local tournaments to the Amateur and Professional World Championships, the PDGA oversees sanctioned events for disc golfers of all skill levels. The PDGA is a not-for-profit organization dedicated to promoting disc golf around the world. To learn more about the PDGA, visit www.pdga.com. Get out and play a round of disc golf. The sport of the future is here today. Mini discs are often used as markers by disc golfers, but they're a hoot to throw as well. Our next video from Chris Beyer is an easy and inexpensive guide to building your own mini basket. So here's everything we need to make our permanent mini basket. First is this nine gauge galvanized steel wire. I found this on Amazon for about $6, 50 feet should be more than enough. I'll be bending that into make the basket and the top chain stay. I got this scrap piece of 2x6 treated wood. It was uh, from the scrap pile, only a couple bucks. That 2x6 is 5.5 inches wide. So what I did was I printed out a couple shapes here. This is a 16 sided shape and this is 12 sided. This is going to be cut out of my piece of wood. The 12 sided for the basket and 16 sided for the top of the chain stay. I got just over 16 feet of number 12 jack chain. I'm going to be making a 16 chain mini basket. This is half inch metal conduit, also pretty cheap, uh, $2 for a 10 foot. I'm going to cut that in half and I'll have a 5 foot pole to work with to hold up the mini basket. And then I also got some yellow Rust-Oleum, optional. I'm going to paint the basket in the chainstay. This is my half inch metal conduit. It's 10 feet long and I've marked it at four and a half feet. I'm going to cut it in half and I'm going to cut it at four and a half feet so I have a longer and a shorter post for some variation. I'll be able to have two baskets out of this post. I'm going to cut it at an angle so that I have two stakes that I can then drive into the ground. two stakes that I'll be able to use for posts. So this is a jig that I've made out of part of the scrap piece of wood. This is going to be where I make the top chain stay 
and also the basket. I'm going to make 12 of these basket arms and I'm going to make 16 arms for the top of the basket to hold the chains. So I'm going to make one of the top basket arms. And there we have one. So I've made 16 of these basket arms and having the jig makes it really easy to make them all the same. So I'm going to have 16 spokes going all the way around the top of the basket and the chain will stay in here and I'll have a loop of wire going around in a circle through this top loop. So now what we're going to do is make one of the basket assembly arms. And there we go. So I've taken my chain, I got just over 16 feet, and I've separated it into 16 separate strands. All you need to do is take a pliers and open up each piece of chain, no need to cut, and get 16 that are all the exact same length. So I've taken my wood scraps and I've cut a 16 sided and a 12 sided shape. I've also cut two octagons that I'm going to place in the middle for some added stability. Now I'm going to drill holes through these and the size of the holes I'm going to be doing is 11 sixteenths of an inch. It's not a common size, I had to actually go buy a bit for a couple dollars but it's worth it. If you only have a three quarter inch bit you can use that but the holes are going to be a little loose. So I've drilled my 11 sixteenths inch holes into my four blocks of wood. And like I said, you could use a three-quarter inch hole, but it just might be a little sloppy on the half-inch conduit. What I'm going to do is attach these blocks of wood, and these extra blocks of wood are just for added stability. I could use just the base. And once I attach these, I'm going to put some wood glue and a few screws in. I'm going to be able to put these right on to the half-inch conduit. And now what I need to do is take my wood blocks and I've glued these extra pieces on there for some additional support. I need to drill some holes into the sides of this. One eighth inch bit that I can then put all of my metal pieces into. This is going to hold on to the basket and the chain stay. Now that I've drilled the holes in my two blocks of wood, I'm just going to take a hammer and insert the basket pieces into the blocks of wood. And the same with the top chainstay pieces into the 16 sided block of wood. So I've taken my metal pieces and I've hammered them into my wooden blocks for both the basket pieces and the top chainstay pieces. We're starting to get something that looks like a basket. Now what I'm going to do is make some metal circles and put them through these loops. So I've finished putting rings around the top of the chainstay and the basket. I've just put one ring around the top and crimped these together. On the basket I have three rings, one around the bottom, around the middle, and then the top. And then on the top I've crimped the top down on each of these to keep it from moving so these arms are solid and not going anywhere. The basket and the chainstay pieces I've painted up with some yellow rust oleum to help them be a little extra weatherproof since this is going to be a permanent outside basket. What I've done is I first drilled a hole in the top and put my chainstay piece on and then I measured ten and a half inches down from the basket and marked another hole to drill to hold the basket on. I just have a pin that I made out of a paper clip but you could use a few wraps of duct tape or you could use a screw to put through the conduit for a permanent application. I'm going to have a few different posts in the yard so I want these to be interchangeable so I'm using a pin. So I have my basket and my chainstay attached by the pins and the opening from the top of the chain to the basket is ten and a half inches. All I need to do is hang each piece of chain and then I'm going to attach the bottoms 
with a metal ring that I've made. And that's the permanent outdoor basket for less than $20. So this is the finished mini basket. I've just taken the metal conduit and pushed it into the ground and twisted. You don't want to use a hammer because you'll deform the top of the metal conduit and then you won't be able to slide the basket pieces on and off unless it's permanent. I've also made this mini bucket in a different video. This is a little more simple to make and you could also use a permanent type setup if you just drilled the right size holes for this basket in your wood blocks and then the bottom of the basket. You could put pins and slide a basket like this with a top and bucket onto a permanent post. Let's give this thing a try.